ในช่วงต่อไปค่ะเราได้รับเกียรติจากผู้มีการสำนักงานที่งานองค์การอนามัยโลกประจำประเทศไทยจะได้แสดงปาฏิกิริยในมุมมองของผู้ที่รับผิดชอบเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของสุขภาวะอนามัยนะคะนั่นก็คือในหัวข้อของ global trend and movement toward universal coverage and impact of high UCS on global movement ซึ่งได้รับเกียรติจากดรโมรินอีเบิร์มิงแฮมผู้มีการสำนักงานผู้แทนองค์การอนามัยโลกประจำประเทศไทยขอเสียงปรบมือต้องรับท่านวิทยากรของเราด้วยค่ะได้ยินได้ไหมพูดภาษาไทยนิดหน่อยนิดหน่อยเพราะว่าให้ presentation แล้วภาษาอังกฤษขอโทษขอบคุณมากที่ได้มาแสดงความยินดีกับทุกคนที่มาแสดงความยินดีกับทุกคนที่มาแสดงความยินดีกับทุกคนที่มาแสดงความยินดีกับทุกคนที่มาแสดงความ
by medically trained persons. And it shows a sampling of countries. So each vertical bar is a country. And the lowest dot on each vertical bar is the poorest quintile in the country. And the highest dot on each vertical bar is the highest quintile, the richest quintile of the country. And the orange dot is the average in that country. This slide shows you really how much variation there is in the world. Over on your left, you have countries who have hardly achieved an average, not even 10% of the births are attended by medically trained persons. So it shows the disparity between countries, but it also shows the inequities within countries. Within these same countries, you see almost 100% among the richest quintile, and yet way down here, only 20% among the poorest quintile. So much work needs to be done in all countries. This slide shows the millions who suffer financially when they use health services, and it's broken down by regions in the world, the Eastern Mediterranean, the African region, the European, Southeast Asia, the Americas and the Western Pacific region. And it shows you in numbers the number of people who suffer impoverishment when they access needed health services, and the number who, who experience financial catastrophe when they seek needed health services. So although these are numbers, and they're huge numbers, these are also human beings. And so we need to remember the face behind these numbers. Millions are pushed into poverty by using health services. This slide shows you in the black bar here that 1 billion, 300 million people in the world each year are without access to affordable and effective health care. And again, this 150 who suffer catastrophe and the 100 million who are impoverished when they seek health services. In fact, one third of all new annual poverty in the world, one third of the poverty is due to costs in accessing health services. And these costs can be consultation, diagnostics, medicine, or even the cost of transport in some countries to get to health services, or the loss in wages. One third of all new poverty in the world is due to accessing health. Dr. Pankistut asked me to show some trends, so I pulled up two slides on trends. Are we getting any better in the world, or are we getting worse? Well, this slide shows we're getting a little bit better. This shows the general government expenditure on health. So all health expenditure, what proportion came from government, public sources? And it's broken down by low-income countries, middle-income, low-middle-income countries, upper-middle-income countries, and high-income countries. And it shows you the year 2000, and then how it changed in 2009. So at least showing a little bit a little bit better in terms of the proportion of government expenditure, of all health expenditure. Similarly, this is a slide that's also showing a similar situation that's a little bit better, because this is showing the out-of-pocket expenditures. We call them OOPs, when people have to pull out of their pocket at the point of service to pay. That's what impoverishes. Just at the time they need the health service, they're forced to pay. We call it out-of-pocket expenditure. And we can see here that um, between 2000 and 2009, a little bit of improvement, except in the high-income country, but a little bit. So going in the right direction, but not as fast as we'd like. So what is the cause of this um, lack of access to universal care? Well, first is exclusion. 
exclusion linked to factors outside the health system. And these are related to inequalities in income and education, as well as social exclusion. Social exclusion can be based on gender or ethnicity, or if you're a migrant in a country. And these exclusions, as mentioned, they're already outside the health system, so it's taught us health people that we need to learn to start working with our brothers and sisters outside the health system in the other health sectors, in the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Social Welfare and Human Development, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Trade. But also the cause is weak health systems. And WHO is always talking about six building blocks that make a health system work. So the weak health system can be based on some of these building blocks, which are not strong. Could be the health workforce, not sufficient. Medicines and health technologies, not the right ones. Ineffective service delivery, poor information systems, or weak government leadership. These are the five of the six building blocks. But another key building block is the health financing system. So this has also become a big focus, all six building blocks. But in terms of universal coverage, particularly this one. And this has been quite a global movement for over a decade. You can see there was quite a, a landmark um, piece of work on the social determinants of health. The WHO commissioned some work to understand the social determinants of health, the social and economic determinants outside the health sector even, that are barriers to health. And this was put out in 2008, and there was just the first global conference in Rio, in Brazil. Thailand uh, was a big participant in this conference, looking at these social determinants of health. So this is a movement to address this cause and also the weak health systems. There's been the World Health Report of 2000, um, the Global Action Plan of WHO on everybody's business, having strong health systems, and also very landmark document, the World Health Report in 2008 on getting back to the principles and the values and the practice of primary health care. But we need to get back to that. That is the very foundation of a functioning health system. And we need to get back to that. And in the 2010, the World Health Report was on health financing systems and how to make those function. So you can see there's quite a global movement pushed by you, the member states, the 193 member states of WHO, that we must address this. This is this famous, uh, this famous six building blocks of health systems, you can see the health the service delivery, the health workforce, the information system, the proper medical products and vaccines and technologies, financing and the leadership and governance. And we need inputs into this system, we need good access, coverage, good quality and safety to get the goals, the outcomes we want from a health system. Of course, from a health system, we want to see as an outcome improved health, both at the level of health and in terms of equity. But we also want a responsive health system that can respond to the demands, the new health challenges of the people. We also want from a health system social and financial risk protection. We don't want people going into financial ruin because they have a health problem. And we want a health system that's efficient. So what did this World Health Report recommend? Well, its main conclusion is that we need to really look at domestic financing. It's not going to be the external financing. That can help. But it's the domestic financing, the financing within the country that matters. And we've learned, we've learned from countries like Thailand and other countries that every country, every country can do something to advance towards universal coverage or maintain the gains they've made. And that's through raising more funds for health. It's possible in every country. 
reducing those financial barriers to access and social barriers and increasing the financial risk protection and improving the efficiency and equity. So I'll say a few more things about that. Well, there's three pillars when approaching a good health financing policy. And this is how WHO is working and collaborating with member states. First, we need to have a descriptive framework. What, is your, what does your current situation look like? What do you have now? And the second thing is, what are your policy objectives to get to universal coverage? And the third is, what is your fiscal context? What finances do you have? What are your possibilities financially? Everyone's in a different context. So we call this the starting point. This your direction. And this your reality check. Or we might say, this is where should we go? Our policies are going to take us somewhere. But where are we starting from? So we need to have very good analysis of where we are right now in our system. And then we need to look at well, what kind of vehicle can we afford right now to get us there. And depending on that, how far and how fast can we go? And that success towards universal coverage requires good thinkers. Because there's no recipe, there's no cookbook. Every context, every country is different. So you are the geniuses in your own country who need to figure this out. But it's based on good analysis and good policies. And the good examples, like the good example in Thailand, are from countries that invested in their analytic capacity. They established institutions like HSRI, HISRO, IHPP, these institutions who could really analyze good data with good brains and also realize it's important to, to learn by doing. So to analyze while implement, implementing and use the, that information to adapt over time. Because no amount of, perfect, of planning will get it perfect the first time. So we need to keep learning, adapting, analyzing, adapting, learning, analyzing. And we need to develop the capacity in our health system to adapt to the changing circumstances and new challenges that are always happening to our health system. So these were key, looking back at the countries who have achieved considerable success. In most workshops, we're always using Thailand as an example. So I thought this time I'd pull up another country that's shown good success recently. This is the country of Kyrgyzstan, a post-Soviet country. And they did very good analysis and it was the basis for their comprehensive reforms that reduced out-of-pocket and informal payments that were impoverishing the people. And in fact, between 2001 and 2006, they could reduce overall, these overall payments, the out-of-pocket payments and the informal payments by 19%. But if you looked more carefully for services for children, they could reduce those out-of-pocket expenditures by, under, by 52% and for pregnancies by 37%. And they did this by reducing the wasteful spending on hospital infrastructure, on expensive hospital infrastructure. They did this by reducing the fragmentation in their system of financing. They, they pooled their funds a little bit better and defragmented that pooling. And they also shifted to a more demand side financing versus historical service or supply-side financing. They did many things. But they also analyzed very well their information, and they communicated very well with their population, the policies, so that the population was informed. They no longer need to pay these informal payments. They shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be spending so much out of pocket. So the population understood also, and then they continued to adapt as they implemented. So this conclusion of this big report was, again, the domestic financing is what matters. And these are the three things that can be done. Raise more funds for health. It's possible. Let's look at your country. Let's see what's possible in your country. Let's reduce those financial barriers and let's improve the efficiency and equity. So looking at these three areas, what are some of the options in a country? Well, one is, of course, the first thing is to look at the overall government budget. And can we advocate with those policymakers, like you did so well in Thailand? 
you did so well to raise the proportion of government spending on health. You even shifted, I know in the past, you, you, you shifted defense spending towards health to build your rural infrastructure. You did many amazing things. Um, but in fact, 45 countries still devote less than 8% of their spending to health, and 14 countries devote less than 5%. <clears throat> With that low, low spending, they're not going to get very far. There needs to be strong advocacy with their countries. You need a healthy uh, investment in health. It's not a cost. It's an investment in, in your human capital and your population. But also that there are new ways, new and innovative ways you can raise funds. And Thailand also has shown the way. It's been an example in terms of the syntaxes, particularly on tobacco and alcohol. <clears throat> that in, for example, analysis, an analysis was done that we could have a 50% increase, that a 50% increase in tobacco's tax in 22 low-income countries would bring an additional $1.42 billion for health, allowing government health expenditure to increase by 25%. So just imagine, so these kind of analyses are being done. We can raise more domestic funds. Sales tax, country of Ghana, not a rich country, they were able to fund its national health insurance partly by increasing the, the VAT by 2.5%. Some countries, it could be a currency transaction levy could be feasible. India could raise $370 million per year from a very small levy. They're looking at a 0.005%. There have been solidarity levies in Gabon, also a very poor African country. They raised 30 million for health in 2009, partly by imposing a 1.5% levy on companies handling remittances from abroad. So just some examples. So we're trying to, WHO is trying to work horizontally, having countries share with each other how they've done this. It's possible even in the poorest countries. This map shows you though the, the somewhat grim situation. It shows you the government expenditure on health um, using 2007 data, and the red shows less than 5% spending of government spending on health, and the dark blue shows more than 19%. Uh, but you can see this is a real statement that health appears to be a low, pri low political priority in South Asia. You can see how Thailand is a, a shining blue light in this region, because otherwise you have South Asia's red and East Asia's more orange. Not so good either. But here's a, a blue light. The second recommendation was about reducing those barriers and ensuring financial risk protection. So again, the ultimate goal is to get away from out-of-pocket expenditures, the OOPs, at the point of service when people are desperate for health, health service and increase what we call prepayment, the pooling of funds and prepayment for health services. And this is usually done through two ways. One is through health insurance or through taxes. It's classically the two ways that it's done. We've learned over time in many countries, including Thailand, that community and micro insurance schemes are not usually financially sustainable because you don't make enough of a pool of funds we need to make it work for the long term. The pools are too small. We've also learned over time that universal coverage is difficult without making compulsory contributions. In other words, mandatory contributions, either through taxation or through insurance. If it's not compulsory, it really won't work. The rich won't pay or people won't pay until they're sick. Healthy people won't pay, rich people might not pay. But we have seen that there have been major advances that can be made in low- and middle-income countries by following good principles and practices. We've also learned, in most countries, there will always be a poor segment of the population who cannot contribute, who truly cannot contribute, and must be subsidized from pooled fundings. And so, that generally comes from tax revenues. 
and one needs to be able to identify, that's the challenge, identifying that, that segment of the population and ensuring that they're covered as well. So this is the famous cube. I don't know if you've seen this before. It's a well-known cube now to, to, to think about what kind of choices can be made. Because usually these choices are in about three dimensions. So if this is what you're, in your country, if you're covering this much so far, then you need to think in three dimensions. Well, how can I get to the point where I'm covering all my population? Who's not covered? So that's one dimension, the population. The second dimension that one needs to think in, in terms of policy, is which services should be provided. Also, difficult choices, requires good analysis. What are the cost-effective interventions? We have countries who spend very big and get low health outcome because they're not good choices. And we have other countries who make very good cost-effective choices, usually towards public health and prevention and promotion, and they get more health outcome for their money. And the third dimension is the financial protection. Decisions about whether there should be any kind of user payment at the point of service. In some countries there's a small user fee. For a while you had the 30 baht user fee. Now you have no user fee. So this is also a decision that must be made. So these are the three dimensions of policy decision making. We call it this famous cube that helps you think about that. But there's also other aspects. As you reform your system, one needs to think about how well that system performs. And one needs to think about people. And funds are collected, usually in a compulsory manner, in some way for taxation or insurance, to collect revenue. And some way you need to pool those funds. There's decisions, in all, there's decisions here, decisions here. You need to pool the funds. How are you going to pool them? The more you can pool together, the more enabling it is. Then you need to make decisions about how you're going to purchase services. Are you going to have public providers, private providers? How are you going to do that? And then you're going to make decisions about who are you going to get services from, the service provision point. And then how will that be delivered to the people? And then this arrow goes this way, because will there be a user fee at all? So that's the, th the thinking that must go behind it. Another even more simple way of thinking, as one's well making policy choices, is you have to make health investment. And you're making health investment to get health status and financial protection. And you're starting here, and you want to get there through that investment. You make some key decisions. Are you going to go there? Are you going to go this route and make expensive choices to get to universal health coverage and perhaps not get so high, not achieve so much health status-wise? Or are you going to go this way and perhaps choose more of a public health approach, which tends to be more cost-effective and you can often spend less and get more health outcome, and there's everything in the middle. But these are the sort of choices, and you could say there's countries, for example, I can use the U.S. The U.S. has made very expensive choices. They have a very expensive health system in, in the U.S. with not fantastic performance on health status. And you could say a country here could be Cuba. Cuba made very deliberate choices towards public health, and they achieved high health status by making a decision way up here. So these are the decisions policymakers must make. The third area we mentioned was reducing inefficiencies and inequities. inequities. And this World Health Report refers to nine, nine areas that are the most common causes that every country should look at. What are the causes of inefficiency in, in the country? Common causes are usually, if you want to start looking, start looking in the area of medicines and health technologies. Spending too much, paying too high of a price for medicines, inappropriate use, irrational use, 
many, many reasons behind that. That's, that's a challenge in this country, ineffective use and leakage and wastage that's been in your news recently, I know. Or there's hospital inefficiency, particularly overcapacity. Not, not, not too many people going to hospitals for, for health services that could be delivered at the community level, at the primary level. This is very inefficient to have everybody going to a hospital for simple things that could be addressed at the primary level in the community. Or a health workforce that's demotivated, or you have the wrong skills in the wrong place. I know Thailand's looked at all these issues as well. Or, as mentioned, the inappropriate mix of prevention, promotion, treatment, and rehabilitation, spending too much on the expensive, less cost-effective things, and not enough on the more cost-effective things. And there's been some analysis globally that we could reduce, by reducing inefficiencies, we could free up 20 to 40 percent of available resources for health, just by getting more efficient. Imagine. This is one example, the medicines, the famous example of medicines, paying too much. And this graph shows you a median price ratio, which, which basically is a reference price for generic medicines. So anything, and, that's, and this is and the price that, that you pay for these medicines, if the ratio is over one, that means you're paying too much for that medicine compared to the reference price, the reference generic price, okay? So for example, let's look at uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region. These are all different regions. And you see this medicine is ciprofloxacin. For the reference price, this, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, they're paying over four times the generic reference price to purchase ciprofloxacin. Well, why is that? So that's a basis for exploration in your country. Why are you paying that price for ciprofloxacin? What's going on? It shows you in the Eastern Mediterranean, most of these drugs are over one, so we can do better. But there's, there's a lot of work that can be done here on, on generics and, and proper pricing, proper purchasing at the right price uh, of, of generics, of medicines. That third recommendation was also about reducing inequities, protecting the poor and vulnerable. So in addition to these mechanisms of, of prepayment, of pooling our resources from government or insurance revenues, there are other options as well. In some countries, free or subsidized services. I've done this in Thailand. Um, some, some countries have given exemptions or vouchers. That's done in Cambodia, in Bangladesh. Um, for, for poor populations or for spe specific health conditions, often preventive health conditions. This is done in many countries and a subject of study now how well these voucher systems work. Or they're subsidized or free enrollment in health insurance or cash payments. Uh, Indonesia, for example. Indonesia has 17,000 islands and they're trying to set up universal care. And they're setting, and some islands only have 15 families living on them. Their impoverishing health expenditure is, tra is travel from an island to get to health services. So they're looking at some of these other transport costs to get to health services. What can the international community do? This is being asked. This is being asked by countries at the World Health Assembly. There needs to be more global solidarity with improved efficiency at the global level. First of all, keeping current promises. In many countries, um, donors have made promises and commitments to help. And they haven't kept that promise. So that current funding gap, gap in low-income countries would reduce substantially simply if these promises were kept. Second, there's been a number of innovative international financing. A very famous one is the Millennium Foundation that uh, has developed this Unite program for much more efficient procurement of drugs, medicines for HIV, TB, and malaria. Uh, a very famous example. Still an experiment in, in, in the works, though we're learning by doing. And getting more efficient at the global level, 
some people say, let's stop making new global initiatives. We keep making new ones with new secretariats, with new mechanisms. We should stop making new ones. But there's many efficiencies that can be gained at the global level as well, among the, the, the partner and donor community. Also, at the global level or the international level, reduce the cost imposed on countries to access external funding. Look at Rwanda. They have to report on 890 different health indicators to the various donors. Imagine. I don't know how many indicators you're, you're reporting on in Thailand. In, in Rwanda, almost 600 indicators for HIV and malaria alone. Imagine how much time that's taking of staff. That's an inefficient, inefficiency. Vietnam had 400 aid missions to review health projects in 2009. I see many of you smiling. You've been victims of this also. Imagine the time that's taking up health stuff. Next, actively support countries to implement domestic health financing strategies and consistent health plans to move too quickly towards universal coverage. This is the key. And thirdly, that donors should buy into these plans, not try to bypass weak systems, channel their funds to build domestic financing capacities and institutions. Don't just bypass the weak system. So, World Health, now we zoom forward to 2011, that was last May, at the World Health Assembly. And I know Thailand was also part of this resolution, pushing for this resolution. And the World Health Assembly, the health ministers, requested WHO to report to the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, the importance of universal care, not just for health, it's for social, social and economic development in the world, for sustainable development, for poverty reduction, and that this should go all the way to the UN General Assembly. This isn't just a health issue. To work closely with partners, to, to repair a plan of action to help member states. Since the World Health Report, there were 55 countries that have requested support from WHO. Technical. How do we do this in our country? To track progress towards universal coverage, to start really monitoring what are countries doing and holding countries accountable and facilitating the sharing of experiences. And this is where Thailand plays a big role. There's some progress on global advocacy. I won't go into all this, but really, the member states are saying, get universal health coverage into the post-MDG goals. You know, we have this Millennium Development Goals up to the year 2015. We need to make sure that the whole issue of universal health care is one of those goals, is, or part of those goals, the new ones that are set after 2015. Because it's about health, it's about poverty reduction. And there's many opportunities, and this is what is making us all in WHO very busy, is the Mexico Ministerial Meeting in April, the World Health Assembly in May, the Rio Plus 20 in June, the G20 Meeting in June, the Health and Foreign Policy Initiative, Thailand is part of this group. In September, the Symposium on Universal Health Coverage in October, this is on research, health system research. The UN General Assembly, at any time coming up, we want to get into that, I'll have a special session. The NGO Alliance on Universal Health Coverage is scheduled for end 2012. World Bank annual meetings and many regional meetings. There's a, me a regional meeting coming up in April for Southeast Asia. So this keeps us, and WHO, if you wonder how we're spending our time, this is one of them, to advocate in every possible way. And this is the plan to support countries. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's um, establishing the vision, analyzing, looking at your finances, what your constraints are, the strategy for change, implementation, learning by doing, analyzing, and then again, around the circle. Thailand's global influence is legendary, with many lessons to share, and they have been shared. They're shared in many documents and many workshops. That, and, and really, first, one of the most important things is you pri prioritized health system development. You built your rural infrastructure. You, you, really, you really did the primary health care thing. Many countries talked about primary health care since Alma Atta, but Thailand did it. You implemented it. And you really became a shining light and an example. 
So you started with a strong foundation. You started back in the 70s, but with a strong commitment and foundation to primary health care. You also invested in strong evidence and uh, generation and use. And you used government revenues for the informal sector, because often using insurance, using uh, insurance often doesn't work so well when you have a small, large informal sector. And you, knew, and you knew this, so you used the more government tax approach. And you centralized pooling for 47 million people. That was very enabling. The bigger you can pool, the bigger pool you can make, the more enabled you are to make decisions and, and, and spread risk across the population. And you made this purchaser provider split that all gets very technical, the shift to the capitation scheme. And you, you show with your data that you're doing it at a, at a pretty low cost. Uh, you're, you're, doing that, you're doing that pretty well. You have good data to show that. Other lessons and key challenges in Thailand, and you've been very honest and transparent about some of your challenges. You just did a big, a big um, evaluation after 10 years of your system. Uh, and you, should, you, you uncovered some of the gaps and the challenges you still have. And one of the issues is you had to spend a lot of money on the curative care. And you did a health, re you did a health reform in 2001, but you didn't really reform how you're spending on health promotion and disease prevention. And I know you're making some changes now to that. I know that's in the works. But really, don't lose that focus. Don't lose that on prevention and promotion. You've been legendary and you need to keep that. And it slipped a little bit. It got, up, got us all a bit worried in Thailand. That is, the, that is a cost-effective investment. Um, it was, it's well known that your distribution of human resource for health is still a challenge, how you distribute that. And that there's some, still some issues of uneven access to health services for remote areas and for migrant populations. You have two to four million migrants in Thailand who contribute to your economy. They're an important part of your economy. They contribute substantially and their access to services is uh, a little shaky. Thailand's global influence, also there's a growing number of countries who have moved in the same direction. And many of them were influenced by your success. They recognize that these, this contributory approach will not achieve, you see, in other words, the insurance approach won't work. We need general taxes. To, you know, there's a large informal sector, um, I won't go into details here, but channel the general government funding from direct budgeting to su of supply to purchaser side subsidies, and all those countries have followed your example. Also, the second point, you're a very kind and generous host to many study tours. I knew this as the WHO representative. So many groups want to come in and see your system, and you're always, even at the last minute, we had a request on Monday. To, to show around some people, some visitors, on Thursday, tomorrow. And your government, you are still said, okay, it's fine. And you're hosting people with a three-day notice. You're always very kind and generous to host others. You have uh, workshops, you have study tours, and many conferences, and the huge example of the Prince Mahidol. And you're very generous in sharing your knowledge and your experience, your challenges as well as your successes. And you're also used in many, many workshops and documents. Most recently, next month in Paris, Thailand is a case study in a workshop. It's a seminar um, of World Bank, WHO, and Harvard University. Thailand is the case study. Um, there's also a course in Barcelona coming up. It's one of many, two of many examples. So as I, as I, as I finish, from my own boss, Dr. Margaret Chen, the Director General of WHO. She said this in 2008 when she was um, opening the 61st World Health Assembly to all, your health, all the health ministers. She said, when I took office at the start of last year, I called for a return to primary health care as an approach to strengthen health systems. My commitment has deepened. If we want to reach the health-related goals, we must return to the values, principles, and approaches of primary health care, prevention and promotion, the most cost-effective investment. So we want to move away from weak health systems that are overloaded. We don't want this, right? They're overloaded with too many people coming 
to hospitals for simple things. And we want to move towards this. Strong health systems based on a strong primary health care and good financing. Thank you very much, Captain Mohan. Thank you.